So, Tim, this episode of Behavioral Grooves is, in my humble opinion, probably <laughs> one of the coolest that we have ever, ever had. All right. In your humble opinion, why do you say that, Kurt? <laughs> okay, so for starters, it was just about four years ago that we had our very first conversation with Annie Duke, who happens to be the guest on this episode. Oh, man, four years. Okay, so as I recall, we were... <laughs> Rat memory lane trip, memory lane trip. Here we go. <laughs> yes. Okay. 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 But is uh, so we had re we recorded Annie's conversation, and then we were wrapping up our grooving session for this episode, so that we could head to San Francisco for a behavioral science summit, and that was being put on by Om Marwa, who had just left Walmart as the chief behavioral scientist. We had some, I just remember these really great conversations with Ohm and with Jeff Chrysler, who is now the head of behavioral science at J.P. Morgan Chase. We talked to Roger Dooley before he yeah. wrote Friction, right? Yeah. It was it was an amazing week. I just, it, it was, it was, it was and it was a wonderful trip down memory lane. But before we get too far from the point, <laughs> Mr. Hulahan, all right, <laughs> all right. Th okay. that first conversation with Annie four years ago led to many, many other conversations with her. Don't know why, but uh, she Did. seemed to take a yeah. shining. And, and anyway, sometimes those conversations were over a glass of wine, sometimes just over Zoom. And what makes this even cooler is that this is our fourth published conversation with her. Yeah. More, Tim, more than any other guest that we've ever had. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, even more cool is that we've stayed in touch with Annie and consider her a friend, a confidant, and she's emerged as one of the leading thinkers in the science of decision making. And I would have to say that her powerhouse intellect really shines through in this latest book. Agreed, Kurt. Totally agree. Uh, our conversation in this episode, as you now know, is with Annie Duke, and we talked to her about her new book, Quit, The Power of Knowing When to Walk Away. And this is the final aspect of what makes this the coolest episode ever. <laughs> This book is freaking awesome. I mean, it takes a concept that we often think of as a negative, i.e. quitting, and it turns that idea around. And and for me, it really made me rethink what I had believed. And I love that when we have guests that make me rethink what I believe. You hit that nail on the head, Kurt. Uh, it is one of my favorite concepts for this year to know when to say enough is enough. Okay. And if you don't know about Annie Duke from hearing her on the show three previous times, well, let me tell you a little bit about her. So after leaving grad school for a health issue, she retreated to Montana and learned how to play poker during her recovery. Oh, and boy, did she learn how to play poker. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yes, she did. Annie became one of the first female pioneers in poker and one of the first to win the World Series of Poker Bracelet. Yeah, that's yeah, pretty amazing. Uh, amazing. And then then after she wrote a book about her poker prowess, she made a left turn to go into corporate consulting, which eventually led to her first behavioral science book, which we love to this day. And by the way, that's called Thinking in Bets. And if you haven't read it, get it and read it. Oh, my gosh. Thinking in Bets brought a new layer of ideas to decision making and living a better life. And Annie's new book, Quit does that as well. In Quit, she details the psychological underpinnings to why we are often tempted to avoid quitting and how to overcome that urge to keep going when we shouldn't. Because our conversations with Annie are so comfortable, we kind of let them take their own course. And in this case, <laughs> right, we chatted with Annie for more than 90 minutes. Uh, now we're including most of it, almost all of it in this episode. So I'd just say plan on commuting with this episode for the next day or two. <laughs> <laughs> Don't quit it too early. That's no, what we're saying. And no. there you go. And we're certain you're going to come away from it with a new appreciation for giving up and letting go. So with that, Groovers, we encourage you to sit back with a full pour of quitting on the rocks and enjoy our conversation with Annie Duke. Annie Duke. Welcome back to Behavioral Groups. I think it was, it's my third time or fourth? Fourth time. <gasps> fourth time. Wait, so wait, when I get to five, do I get one of those Saturday Night Live jackets? <laughs> we might, we, we'll, we'll send you a, a, a 
behavioral groups mug. How about that? There you there go. You go. She's already got a behavioral groups mug. I, think I know. I want one. one of the velvet jackets that say five. Oh, well, you know, we'll have to get those. <laughs> You'll be the first one to five, so we'll have to come up with our own special okay. thing. Sounds okay. good. The, Sounds the good. velvet jacket for Annie. Nice there we go. Well, this is so exciting. We are, are super excited to have you back. As always, we get to talk to you this time about your new book, Quit, which I, I just have to say we've been hearing about now for a, a while. <laughs> And we've been super yeah. excited. We like couldn't talk Get about you. some of the things because you were sharing some things. And then I was like, ah, oh, here it's coming out. So, ah, it's going to be fun. So how's it? Yeah. So how's the journey been? Uh, have, have you, you know, are you having fun? Did you, are you, are you glad that you've finished the damn thing? Or how did you shrink 60,000 words from one chapter into 45,000 words for a whole book? That's, that's like, maybe that's my first question. Well, it's 65, no, it's 75,000 words. Oh, is it 75,000? Okay. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> did you, you clearly oh. when you read it, you didn't count. <laughs> no, I did not. But didn't, didn't, when you read the first, you were reading the first chapter to us, you know, months and months ago. And I think you had 60,000 words just for the first chapter. No, no, no. So here's what happened. You guys heard some of the proposal, which was 60 pages. Oh, well. That's where the 60 comes from. All right. Okay. Then Thank you. I told you that I had pitched them a 60,000 word book. And the reason why I pitched them a 60,000 word book is because thinking in bets, my agent had told me to pitch a 75,000 word book and they asked me for 60. I, I, it was, it was like 65. It was slightly over. And then my last book was supposed to be 50. And I think it was pretty close to that. And so I just pitched 60 because I thought, oh, they like short books for me. And so when I turned in the proposal, they were like, why only 60? We want 75. <laughs> so so anyway, I think it's about 75,000 words. So that's where it's see, But the numbers, like the numbers were attached to something. You just had them at, at, I, attached I just to the totally thing. misconnected them. Yes. Thank you for straightening but this out. But this is why we should not draw analogies from computers to the human brain because that is not how we remember things. It so isn't that how is we good... remember things at all. That's no, right. there no. is no way. So yeah. computer, yeah, computer wouldn't screw that up, but I would. No, 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 because no, everything is just date and time in a file, right? Uh -huh. We're contextually driven. So yeah, yeah, and, and our memories get reformulated every single time we we that we is do exactly them. right. Yeah. So what I was reading to you from was the proposal. Ah, Which, yes. Okay. By the way, a sixty-page a sixty-page proposal is not All standard right. for those of you who are like writing books. Is that correct? Well, I... yeah. So I was actually talking to Ryan Holiday about this the other day because he's a proposal writer, also. Yeah. So when I was thinking about this book, and you guys were pretty early to the idea, I I had talked to my agent about it. He he responded well to the idea, and this is the first time I've ever titled my own book. I just want to say that because like I don't think I'm a particularly good titler. But this one, like immediately, I knew I want to write a book called Quit. So then I I, I got on the a Zoom with my editor over at Portfolio. And I was like, hey, I just want to kind of run this by you. Do you think it's worth pursuing? And she told me, oh, just just pitch it. We'll buy it. That's basically what she told me. <laughs> wow. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. I'm going to write a proposal. And I had this conversation with Ryan Holiday because I I'm sure we'll get to it about monkeys and pedestals, yeah. right? Yeah. That. The, the problem with a book is not actually just like putting the words on a page. It's it's more, first of all, is there a book there? Like you have this idea, quit, as you start to sort of dive deep into the research, is there, an, is, is there a body for a book? Because the thing you don't want to do is take something that should have been a, a blog post, <laughs> right? And and turn it right. and try to turn that into a book that, that we've can get. read too many of those. We've right. never yeah. had guests like that that we've had. Yeah, yeah. we're yeah. like the first chapter is awesome, and then yeah. the first chapter repeats itself for ten more yeah. times. So and then you're kind of going, why are we talking about this again in yeah. chapter yeah. nine? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you know, you have to figure out is it an actual book. And then this is a really big problem is you have to figure out how do I structure it? Yeah. How do I get into it? What's the middle look like? How do I get out of it? Now, for none of my books have the has the final order of the book been the same as in the proposal, but the proposal makes you do that work. And that's actually the hard work of the book is to say, like, how am I going to sort of anchor the order of, of kind of what's going on here? How do I get into the material? You know, where how am I thinking about the order in which the science goes? So like for me, for this book, because there's so many different biases that relate to quitting, you know, I had to think about when am I in introducing the idea of escalation of commitment, which is sort of the broad category. Is that coming really early? Is it coming later? Where's sunk cost going or endowment or identity? And then I had a real, just a, it was a 
beast of a problem trying to figure out where I was going to put the work on on goals and the, and the way that mm. goals can actually stop us from quitting things. And I think in the proposal, it was chapter four. And then I was writing it. I moved it later. And then it actually ended up being the, the last chapter it's of the, the book end. and close, yeah. but which is really where I, I figured it should be because it kind of ties everything together. But that type of work of like trying to figure out, can I take this ball and create something linear out of it that's going to make sense? Can I figure out, like, do I actually have good, like, narratives that are going, you know, because you have to write some of the narratives for the proposal. You have to think about the table of contents. I think that it's so incredibly important to do that before you start writing. Because if if you're writing and you haven't actually unlocked that part of it, there's kind of no point in doing the writing. So I actually went out. She told me in December, don't, you know, whatever, just pitch it. And I actually turned the proposal in in February. So I, I took two months just to like write just the proposal. Write and and did Ryan Holiday, does he do the same thing in kind of that long format? Yeah. Because again, we've talked to, we've talked to many people and they're talking, no, proposals, two, three, five pages. That's it. That's kind of, you know, yeah. it's the outline and, and you don't get into it. I loved the part though, when you were reading from that proposal to us is you talked about those narratives, the narratives yeah. that you had up front lent, I think, a lot of credence to the story that you're basically ending up telling in this whole thing, because it yeah. really highlights some of those aspects of why, A, why this is so important, but B, then the the downside of what happens when you don't when, quit. On yeah, time. when there's a failure to quit. And part of like, so my proposal had a pro the prologue ended up being a little bit different, but the proposal had a pretty fully developed prologue, which was kind of an introduction to the material. It was a little different than the pro prologue in the book because I was introducing the material to the publisher. So yeah. it was slightly different, but had a lot of the same kind of stuff. And then it had a full chapter one. And then as I was working out the other chapters, most of them also had some sort of narrative in it. Cause I'd done a lot of research up front for this one. So, yeah. you know, but Ryan Ryan said he 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 is also a proposal writer again, for his own thinking, because it's it's the hard part of the problem. But he also said something funny, which I realized afterwards is true. It's like, well, of course, they don't want you to write a proposal because they can get the book cheaper that way. <laughs> because if you actually write out the proposal and it's good, then they realize, oh, you you could just send this to other publishers. Like, and we then, better step up to the plate. It's going to be a, a bidding war, yeah. So. Right. So, I, I, I sadly, I can't say that I was thinking that way, but <laughs> but he wow. did point that out to me. So Annie, one of the things in, in the book, and we'll get more into in depth on some of the concepts in the book, but one of the things in the book is you tell it's kind of your own story about your quitting going, you know, when you were in your PhD program and the factors that go along in this. And I thought that was really interesting. And I was wondering if you thought about just the concept of quitting and if your own history played a part in you thinking about this differently because one of the things that you talk about in the book is look we have all these all these uh statements about you know grit and staying with things and but we don't have very many on quitting and how good quitting is and so it's obviously kind of contrary to the popular belief system I'm wondering if any of your own history do you think played into you thinking about this very differently even with your poker playing even with you know some of the other things that are going yeah. on so let me just say, first of all, I now know that Kurt read chapter 10. <laughs> so that's I don't right. Hold Annie, no, Annie, I'm saying, Annie, well, Annie. there's only 11 chapters in it. I hope, you know, I mean, I guess yeah, you could I, have I, quit I, after I, chapter I 10. I finished after that. It's like, ah, I'm done. Right. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny because people, I have been asked that question, right? Like, what's the biographical or autobiographical genesis of this book? And I, you know, I feel a little bit like I'd be kind of retrofitting in some way. like. Yep sort of sense making in a way that it might not be true to reality. So, I mean, the things that I do know is that, so the the chapter in which I appear is on lessons from forced quitting. Because yeah. one of the things we need to realize is quitting isn't always voluntary. Sometimes we're like, we get fired. And so then we have to quit. So if, in my case, I was in a, a graduate program. Uh, I did five years, like all the way to really just like, I was on the job market. Like, just had to defend my thesis. And I had been struggling with like a stomach illness that was pretty bad. And I actually ended up in the hospital for a couple of weeks. Uh, and so I was forced to take some time off. And it was during that time that I started playing poker. And then I never went back to, yeah. to graduate school until a few weeks ago. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I'm, I'm a graduate student. 
Yeah. I told my husband, by the way, I was like, you should tell people you're married to a graduate student. Yeah, <laughs> like, it'll be so scandalous, yeah. right? The trophy one. Because my husband go. is 62, right? Like, <laughs> it's so great. Like, marrying a graduate student. Anyway, so, you know, that actually, like, I've had a lot of feelings about that in my life. Like, yeah. the feeling of quitting, having failed, you know, so on and so forth. And that's despite the fact that what I ended up doing obviously turned out really well. Yeah. And... So, you know, I, I do say that that kind of thing can get you to pay more attention to to sort of like, what are you missing out on by doing the thing that you're doing? You know, because that's really what happens when we're forced to quit. Yeah. And you could think about this in terms of the Great Re- Resignation also, where people kind of think about the Great Resignation as everybody quitting, but that's not actually true. There was a certain sector that was the most impacted by the pandemic, which was the service sector. And, you know, it was just like, you know, massive numbers of people were furloughed or or laid off or let go. And all of those people now who aren't going into their jobs have a lot of opportunity at that point to explore their values, to really think in a more objective way about whether they liked what they were doing, to think about what the other opportunities are that are available to them. And so when the great reopening happens, when everything kind of opens back up, what you see is it's not everybody quitting across the board. It's people in the service sector so the very people who were forced to quit now are voluntarily quitting later. And I think for me, you know, obviously I quit. I had to explore other ways to make money. I ended up playing poker. Um, that obviously worked out really well. And then I think I did carry that exploratory mindset through my life because then I started to give talks and then I was interested in being a consultant. And I think I sort of let go of the idea that you only do one thing at a time mm-hmm. um, or or for your whole life. And And I've been like, a super big switcher. Yeah. So, you know, is that the genesis of it? Is it because in poker folding is like an incredibly important skill? Folding just means quitting. Yeah. Uh, and you have to think a lot about like folding and when do you quit games and that kind of thing. Maybe the way that I have experienced wanting to talk about quitting was a little bit more just a frustration around people not understanding the value of that option when you're deciding under uncertainty, which is what makes me think it comes more from poker. Mm. Like, again, I don't know. I'm making things up, but it makes me think it comes more from poker because when you decide and you don't have a lot of information and luck is going to, you know, intervene in some way, good or bad, and you you know that you're going to discover all sorts of information after the fact, that's that feeling, I wish I knew then what I know now because you learned something new. The option to quit is what allows you to deal with that problem because, okay, it's fine. I'm I'm deciding under uncertainty, but when I learn new things, I can switch. But all I observed at the poker table was people not being willing to do that, (laughs) right? They just, you know, elite players are very good at folding. Amateurs are not. Amateurs, you know, say things like, I had too much money in the pot, yeah. you know, or I just Fun wanted cost. to see how it, how it turned out. Yeah. They'll say that. I like, I want to see the two last seven And look, I got a, I, you know, I got a full house. Right. And then I they won, never want, yeah. <laughs> they never want the pain again of having to see that they would have won the hand. And so they stay in every single hand. So you see that this, this option to quit is really like this, this skill element of the game of poker that's so incredibly important. And if you were to persevere, you would be playing Baccarat or something. I don't know. Yeah. It just wouldn't look much like poker. And so I was, just, I was just frustrated. I think that's really what it came from mm-hmm. is that here's this really valuable option that we just don't appreciate. No, we man. don't appreciate how much this allows us to get out of things that aren't getting us anywhere. And, you know, and I, th- one thing I do want to say, I just want to say this off the bat because I don't want, any, you know, people have said to me like, oh, you know, you must think Angela Duckworth's work is, you know, bad or something. (laughs) Yeah. Get this on the record. Yes. Yeah. I just want to put on the record. She's brilliant. Her book is brilliant. Everybody should read grit. What I'd like people to do is stop misinterpreting the book grit. By the way, I'm not going to speak for her, but I think that she also would like people to stop misinterpreting her work. (laughs) Because if you, even in the title, it says the power of passion and perseverance. It's the passion part, right? You have to find the thing that's worthwhile. You have to find the thing that it gets you to where you want to go that you really want that is going to is going to really make your life something great and you have to stick to it even if it's hard. Mm-hmm. Nowhere in that book does she say just stick to things and that somehow synonymous with character. She why would you stick to something if you have like a get a concussion in the middle of a football game or break a 
foot as you're running a marathon or or, or your fibula or bone, leg, yeah. <laughs> which by the way is not a joke. Like as you I, know, like people oh, do this all the time. So, yeah. and she's very much about like this idea of try a whole bunch of stuff, quit the stuff you don't like. And then the thing that is your passion stick to, even if it's hard. No. And I, we have totally agree. Like someone said to me, Oh, you should have a discussion. And I was like, it would be really boring. <laughs> Cause no. we both go. Yeah. 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 It'd be like, okay, we agree with each other. <laughs> cool. Um, so, so yeah, so that's all. I just like, I think I, w- I think I was frustrated. That's why I think I wrote this book because I was frustrated. Yeah. But grit and quitting are not polar opposites. They're the same decision. Yeah. <laughs> like if you, if you choose to stick to something, you're choosing not to quit. And if you choose to quit something, you're choosing not to stick. I mean, <laughs> and that's true at any moment. Like we don't experience every morning that we wake up and we go to a job that it's a new decision, right? Should I, should I take this job? But it is every morning. It's a new decision. Should Mm -hmm. I keep going or should I, should I walk away from this? And it's the exact same decision. And what really, really matters, what matters the most is what is your calibration? Are you calibrated on that question of when do you stick and when do you quit? And this is where we get really bad because these, these things are complicated, right? And the fact is that we do view grit as a virtue and quitters are losers. Mm-hmm. So like the title of the first chapter is the opposite of a great virtue is also a great virtue. I cannot take credit for that. That actually is something that Phil Tetlock said to me in a Zoom that we did when I was just trying to talk to the people who are like way smarter than me every single day about the topic. Sounds very Rory Sutherland. Um, Actually, I think yeah. he said it's, something like yeah. that when he was on the show. So, yeah. Yeah. So he and he's going from, you know, there's the opposite of a great truth is also a great truth. So he was riffing on that. And that was his point. Right. Like it's a dialectic between the two things. And and what really matters is not to say some sort of heuristic or rule of thumb that says stick to things. And, and that's good. It's really it, what's the expected value? Mm-hmm. Like you're on a path. You have a goal. Is this getting you, is this causing you to green ground toward the things that you want to achieve in your life? And I'm not talking like just like one marathon. I'm talking like, I want to be a runner and I want to run lots of marathons or or let's just say happiness, right? Like I would like to be, as I go through my life, I would like to accrue happiness. And the question is like, is the path you're on actually causing you to gain ground toward that? That's question number one, because a lot of times, no, it's causing you to lose ground. Like if you're in a job with a toxic boss. And sometimes even if it's causing you to gain ground, the other thing is like, we we don't see the other things you could be doing with that time or energy or money or attention or whatever. And there's other things you could be doing that would actually get you to where you want to go faster. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where we sort of lose sight of it is that we think about one is good, one is bad, as opposed to what is it that actually drives the, drives the decision about whether you should stick or quit. Yeah. Let's get into this a little bit, because I think what we're talking about here is that Hey, quitting is hard. It's viewed negatively. But what are some of the, as as you know, our our listeners are all, you know, psychology buffs and are interested in the behavioral science behind things. What what are some of those psychological aspects that make quitting so hard for people? Well, how much time do we have? Well, we, we, we booked an extra half hour with you. You know that. Yeah. So. <laughs> not nearly enough time, but still. No, but, not nearly enough time. No. So here, here's the thing that I thought was really interesting as I really dove into it is that there's a, a very broad set of cognitive biases that really you can, you can frame as a bias against quitting. You can pull this quitting thread through all of them. Mm-hmm. And this is separate and apart from some other issues that just have to do with sort of our own need for certainty, right? So we can start with our own need for certainty. I'll just rattle off a few of them because we'll get to them. But uh, so you have just generally the phenomenon of escalation of commitment, which is that when we get bad news, we think we're going to react rationally to it. But it turns out not only do we not walk away, we actually escalate our commitment to the cause. Like, I believe it even more. Yeah. People intuitively might not think that's true, but just think about like QAnon, right? Mm -hmm. Like lots and lots and lots of evidence comes in that that belief system might not be true. Like you believe that that the ex-president is going to be president again on March 4th of 2021. When it doesn't happen, we all say, wait, why do they still believe in that? And it's not just they believe in it, they believe in it more. 
Absolutely. So, okay, so we, we need to understand that that's true for failing projects, products that you're developing, jobs that you're in, relationships, so on and so forth. We, we become more entrenched in it. There's sunk cost fallacy, which we can talk about. There is endowment, which has to do with ownership over things, status quo bias, omission, commission bias, uh, the asymmetry of loss aversion. Uh, There's yeah. also something called sure loss aversion. Uh, that's another one. Uh, uh-huh. It ties a little bit into prospect theory. There's issues of identity and then internal and external validity that has to do with like the way that we sort of view ourselves and want to see ourselves as consistent and the way that we want other people to view us as consistent, right? Like we don't, we don't want other people to judge us harshly. So that that's a some of them. It's not even <laughs> it's all not of even them. Not even all of them. And we can, uh, yeah. So, but we can start with this simple fact. I mean, here, here's the thing that I think is really interesting is there's a little bit of a paradox embedded in this. We've talked about the value of this option to quit and dealing with the initial decision to start. Okay, so you start something, you know very little in comparison to all there is to be known. There's also going to be luck that's going to get in your way. So even if you did have perfect information and you knew it was going to work out 80% of the time, 20% of the time, you're going to observe a bad outcome. And sorry, bud, like you just don't have control over when you observe that. So after the fact, after you've started something where you're choosing to do it under uncertainty, I mean, think about like, for example, when you hire someone, really how little you know about that person, right? It's like kind of nuts, right? Like <laughs> right. you have a CV, a few references, right? And you, you've, you had a few interviews. It's like if someone married someone after like three dates and a couple friends telling them they were yeah. cool. It's kind of like <laughs> right. picking a pod coast co-host, right? And <laughs> right. Uh, my God, we could have quit this many years ago. But you exactly. know, hey, yeah. Exactly. yeah, there you go. So now it's when you're when you're starting things under that much uncertainty, there's gonna be information discovery after the fact. Yeah. yeah. Right. It whatever it is. And, you know, you figure out the employee works out, the employee doesn't work out, whatever. And that option to quit allows us to react to that new information. But here's the rub. Here's the paradox. The thing that's so interesting is that the decision about whether to quit or not is also made under uncertainty. Mm. So uh, that, ah, shock. Right? Yeah. So let's think about it. When, if we were completely omniscient, the moment you should quit, taking into account switching costs, So let's just set switching costs aside and assume that, yes, we understand that you have to take into account switching costs, but let's just assume no switching costs for just for sake of, you know, making this easy. If we were omniscient, we would switch when the path we were on went negative expected value, meaning that we were losing ground toward our goals, or when we were on a path that was like, okay, but there was something that was way better. Right. Okay. So we can think about it like we're on a road to work and there's a huge accident. Now, new information, we'd exit to go get to another route that's going to get us there faster. Or maybe we were on a route that got us to work in like 40 minutes. And then some friend tells us about a different route and that gets us there in 30 minutes. And even though it was pretty good what we were doing, yeah, uh, we should switch to the other thing. So if we were omniscient, sort of life decisions would be like that. We'd somehow be able to see that traffic was moving really slow. We'd be able to see that there are other opportunities where traffic was moving a little bit faster compared to the one that we were on. Okay, but we're not omniscient. These things are forecasts. That's the thing, right? We're forecasting based on the information that we have right now. And that's the interesting thing about quitting is that the moment that if we were omniscient, we would know we should quit, probably nothing particularly dire is happening to you in that moment. So what happens? Because we don't like ambiguity, we don't like uncertainty, is that we keep chugging along trying to accrue more certainty so that we know that that it's the right decision. That's what we're trying to get to is some something around 100% sure. And as as Richard Thaler, Nobel laureate, I like to quote Nobel laureates. They're smarter than me. <laughs> smarter than all of us all on this podcast us. right now. Yes. Yep. Combined. As, as, Richard, as Richard Thaler, Nobel laureate, uh, said to me, really the only time that we were really willing to quit is when it's not a decision anymore. Yeah. And what did he mean by that? Like you already fell into a crevasse. Like, what are you going to do? You can't keep climbing. Like the snowstorm is already upon you and you can't see, or like you've just had it up to here with an employee. And you're saying like, I spent the last six months like coaching them and they've been promised me they're going to turn it around. And now they just screwed this thing up that like, I just literally can't, or I'm in a job with a toxic boss and I just took all my six day, sick days because my anxiety is so bad. And now I'm having a panic attack before I go into the, into work. And so that's usually what's happening, right? Is that we're getting to a point 
of so much certainty before we're willing to make the switch that we're getting to that decision incredibly late compared to when it was probably correct to do it. And when when you talk to people and you talk about things that they quit and you say, do you, do you think you should have done it earlier? Do you think you should have waited longer? Whatever. Like everybody's like, oh my gosh, I totally should have done that way before yeah. I did. Months ago. Years Months ago. ago years yeah. ago. Yeah. Years ago. And why are they doing that? Because the only way for them to know for sure how it's going to turn out if they stick to it, because you know, perseverance is that builds character. And if you quit, then you failed and you're a loser. So the only way, way they're willing to do it and to sort of take that L is when they know and they know that other people will know that they didn't have a choice. Yeah. But it comes also to that point of if I I fire that employee and that employee goes on and works at another place and makes some amazing discovery or makes the big sale and I just go, oh, so I gave up on that person too soon. The That fear, as you've talked mm-hmm. about in the book, the loss of version component that goes with that, a number of other factors that go along with that is something that really gets at us. It's that idea of, and you talk about it in poker terms too, right? It's like, oh, I know the odds on this aren't good, but I just want to see. But what, I, mean, I yeah. can't, I couldn't possibly stand to see that I would have made a yeah, full house if my that crappy hand. gets up and I would have yeah. won. Then I'll, I'll I, just jump yeah. out a window. Like yeah. that'll be the end of me. Yeah. I mean, I think this is something really important for people to understand. So I'm sure we're going to get to talking about sure loss aversion, which most people aren't as familiar with, which is a problem with stopping. But loss aversion, you know, is a problem with starting things. And what does it mean? It just means that when you're considering any option, you prefer options that carry a, have associated with them a smaller chance of losing. So this is separate from expected value. So, so when we think about, for example, like someone being an incrementalist as opposed to an innovator, you know, what we're seeing is an, a, a loss aversion problem is that they're choosing something that has very little chance of losing very much, right? Because it's kind of like building on the way things that are already done. But that also means it can't win very much, which means the expected value is pretty small. Whereas when you innovate, you have these chances of these huge world changing things occurring, but you also like a much higher probability of failing. And just as human beings, like we tend to want to avoid, you know, those kinds of associated losses, even if it's, uh, if the expected value is positive. So like the classic example would be, I just say to you, I hand you $10. I say, here's $10. Hey, do you want to flip a coin? I'll give you $20. But if you lose, you have to give me the 10, right? So now you've got this 50% chance of losing something. And and there's some fun videos on YouTube where people do this. And the people are like, no way. And in fact, you can see people who are getting offered $50. Yeah. And they say no. So that's loss aversion where you're just giving up Classic. value to yeah. try to avoid the loss. So you won't take, you won't start something because of it. Okay, so what now we've got that to, you know set up. So what does that have to do if it's a problem with starting? What does that have to do with quitting? Well, it's because we don't recruit loss aversion symmetrically associated with the thing we're doing versus the thing we're thinking about switching to. So you can think about the thing we're doing as kind of the status quo. It's kind of what we're already doing. And as I said before, we're not thinking about starting that anew every day. So that's just like the thing we're doing. Like it's sort of the the this is goes into omission commission bias that mm. like we just. Don't experience that as a, as a decision to start. So we're doing the thing that we're doing. If we quit, that means we're going to start something new. So that's where loss aversion comes into play. Mm-hmm. So one of my my favorite examples of this from the book is Sarah Olston Martinez, who is a doctor. She's she was an, she's an ER doc, and she also had been recruited to be a hospital administrator. And she was very good at her job. She kept kept getting rec- recruited, you know, on the, on the administrative side. She kept getting promoted, rather. And then, you know, she's down to the point where she's doing maybe like six shifts a month in the um, ER. So she she wrote into me. She had heard me on, I think, Maya Shankar's podcast, A Slight Change of Plans, which is great. People should go listen to it. Fantastic. Exactly. And she wrote into me and said, oh, you know, I got I'm thinking about quitting my job. I got this other job offer, but I'm really stuck. I don't I really don't know what to do. Can you talk to me? Well, you know, I I happen to be writing a book called Quit at the time. (laughs) So I was like, hey do you want to get on a zoom? And she was like, sure. So she talked, she was talking and you know, I said, so tell me about the job that you're in. And it was just like misery, 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 misery. She was just really, really unhappy for a variety of reasons. A lot of it had to do with the way it was impinging on her family life. Cause the administrative job was like 24 seven emails, phone calls, whatever. I actually asked her, can you just go back to being an ER doc, which is 
part of the job that she really loves. She said, no, because things have really changed like during COVID and the, you know, reimbursements and stuff like that. So she, she, it wasn't what it was when she had first started. So it was very clear that she was super, super unhappy. At which point I'm thinking, what's going on? Like, why, why did she write into me? I, I'm a little confused. So I said to her that, I said, so I'm, I'm just, because it seems like you're very unhappy in your job. Why are you stuck? Why are you, what's holding you up from quitting and taking the other job? And this is where it is. But what if I hate the new job? <laughs> Anticipated regret. So it's loss aversion, right? Yeah, exactly. So I was like, huh. So this is all I did. I said, imagine it's a year from now. What's the probability that you're happy in the job that you're in? And she said, 0%. Yeah. Like literally, she didn't say 1%. She said 0%. Zero. Because wow. she had been like three years or something really unhappy in this job. So she was like 0%. So I said, well, what's the probability you're going to be unhappy in the new, uh, ha rather happy? I said, what are the, what's the probability you're going to be happy in the new job? She said, well, I don't know. I haven't done it before, but I guess maybe it's 50-50. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, so is 50% chance of happiness greater than zero? You know, and she got it right there. But I, I mean, yeah. the thing that I think, I hope that people can hear there, because I'm sure that, you know, I've experienced that, you've experienced that, you know, is that what was happening was, the tolerance for having a bad outcome from the status quo from the path she was already on was very high, but that the loss aversion was getting recruited in such a peaked way for switching and starting something new that it was stopping her from doing that. Yeah. So what's interesting is that, yes, loss aversion is a failure. It's like a problem with starting, but then it affects quitting because it stops you from starting new things. So, so go into, you talked about sure loss aversion. Tell us a yeah. little bit more about that and how that compares to just regular everyday loss aversion that we all yeah. deal with. Um, and then I also want to get into endowment because I think that's a key piece of kind of this your book, thing. but it's also really interesting as we move forward. Okay. So, so loss aversion, as I said, is a problem. It stops you from starting things. Yeah. So we're pretty clear on that. Sure. Loss aversion stops you from stopping things. Okay, so Double down this my is bet. <laughs> right. So this is a really bad combo when we're thinking about being on losing paths, and also we have to switch to something new because loss aversion stops us from switching to something new because we have to start something, and sure loss aversion stops us from stopping the thing that we're already doing. Okay, uh, that's really bad. So here's what sure loss aversion is. All right, so let me give you a, a super simple example. You bought a stock at fifty; it's now trading at forty. Yeah. You have a loss on paper. Mm -hmm. of ten dollars it's only when you sell that that re that unrealized loss that loss on paper turns into a sure loss that's the moment that you go from failing to having failed from losing to having lost so you can kind of think about it as like as long as you hold the stock you're keeping the gamble on. You're recruiting luck into the equation. And if luck is still in the equation, no matter the expected value being negative or whatever, there's some chance that you can recover the cause and get it back and you don't actually ever have to realize that loss. You don't have to take that sure loss. So this goes way back to Kahneman Tversky in 1979, which was like the foundational work for prospect theory, where he was really, what you see here is this problem with, sure loss aversion, but also gain seeking, seeking sure gains, which then causes us to be miscalibrated on these quitting and sticking decisions. So it's the classic. All right. And I, I guess we'll do it. Tim, you can, you can do this with me. Oh God. I feel like I'm always the guinea pig on this. Okay. Like guessing, Rightfully so. Oh, Rightfully like guessing so, games. Tim. Right. Oh God. All right. Go ahead. Amy. Pretend, and pretend you. you don't know. Do what actually, because even if you know the answer, you still, you still have it. You still know what your gut is telling you to okay. do. So just I'll, answer I'll, with your I'll gut. I'll answer with my gut. Okay. Yeah. So, Tim, I got $100 for you right here. I can give you the $100 or you can flip a coin 50-50, double or nothing. So, heads, I'm going to give you 200 and tails, I'm going you 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 get nothing. Do you want to take the 100 or do you want to flip the coin? No, I think I'm going to I I don't want to flip the coin. You want to take yeah. the hundred. I want to, okay, I want to take the hundred because. Now, by the way, nothing wrong with that because right. those have equal expected value. Yep. Right. Okay. So 200 or zero, right. Obviously it's two. Averages to a hundred bucks. Yeah. Averages to a hundred. Okay. Now 
Uh oh. I, I'm very sad to tell me that that you owe me a hundred dollars. <laughs> I'm, I'm sad to tell you this, Tim, but you owe me a hundred dollars. Okay. So I'm going to offer you the same thing though. You owe me the hundred. You can either give me the hundred or we can flip a coin. And heads, you're going to owe me two hundred. Tails, you owe me nothing. Now what do you want to do? Now I'm risk seeking. Because yeah. I'm because I'm behind, and I I feel that I can I you can, can feel, feel it that. in your gut, right? Like I do. You totally want to take that bet. I want. So that's that, interesting because that both yep. of them are equal expected value, right? So you right. so in reality you shouldn't see a difference mm -hmm. in the way that people react to those two bets, but the difference is very clear yeah. that when we have the loss on the books, we want to keep the gamble on. In other words, we don't want to stop things. We don't want to close the account because then we have to take the sure loss. But on the reverse side, when we're in the gains. We want to turn those gains into realized gains. Okay, so now it gets even worse. Uh -oh. All right, Tim. Are you ready? Okay. <laughs> I owe you $100. Yeah. I can give, right, yay, exciting. Yeah. Good day for me. <laughs> Good day for you. I can. I got the 100 in my pocket. I can give you the 100. Or we can flip a coin, 220 or zero. Oh, so now it's you're- It's so hard because you know what you want to do, but you know what's in your heart. Oh, you're changing the expected value. And, I know. And it feels, it feels like- I think I'm going to take the hundred. My gut, yeah. my I, take the hundred. I, I can take the hundred. Take, right. take the hundred. I, I can connect. Well, right. I'm, so I'm, congratulations. So so now yeah. what's just happened is you've paid ten dollars. <laughs> yes. For the right. opportunity to take the sure gain. I did. Because yeah. two twenty a hundred is it expected? It's ten dollars more now. Now yeah. now the expected value is one hundred and ten dollars. Okay. Yeah. So you're so we can think about that. Is you're willing to pay me ten dollars in order to just get that hundred <laughs> into your pocket? I, I am. Okay. But now here's the interesting thing. You owe me a hundred again. Sad. You owe me a hundred. <laughs> okay. You can either give me the hundred or we can flip a coin. Heads, 220. You got to give me 220, but tails, zero. You don't have to give me anything. Yeah. And, and I feel like I'm going to be risk seeking. Yeah. You're going to flip that coin. I'm, I'm going to so flip that coin. Once yeah. again, you're paying me $10 to keep the gamble on because that has a negative expectancy of, of a hundred, exactly. negative 110. Exactly. So this is how strong these yeah. these biases are, right? And, so, and we feel them. I, I mean, literally, yeah. I could feel it's like it. You can, you're like, oh, I know I shouldn't because I'm a rational human, <laughs> but I totally want to gamble or I totally, I totally don't want to gamble. Right. So this is, that's that different, you know, that's what sure loss aversion is. So notice that you're already in the middle of it. We've made the math pretty clear, but because of sure loss aversion, you're willing to gamble, even though it costs you something in order to get those you know, to make it so that you have some chance of taking that loss off the books. Now, on the flip side, like this, here's the interesting thing is if, if you think about all the aphorisms about quitting, right? It's always like quitting is for losers. Winners never quit. Quitters never win. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again, blah, blah, blah. And then there's one that's pro quitting and it's quit while you're ahead, yeah. which is what you just did. You cost yourself $10. Yeah. So the amazing thing is that the one thing that's like, hey, I, quitting maybe is a good thing. You should quit while you're ahead is actually amplifying a bias that causes us <laughs> to be irrational and costs us a whole bunch of money. It's incredible. So lest you think that this is just like a, you know, experiment of the mind, uh, there's two really interesting data points that just show this behavior in real life. So the first one is just retail traders, right? Yeah. So retail traders will do things, uh, they, they'll do when they buy a stock, they'll often put in both a, a stop loss and a take gain. So what are those two things? It's basically saying, like, let's say I buy the stock at 50. If it gets if I if it gets to a certain point, like, let's say 65, that I'll, I'm going to automatically sell it at that moment. So it's supposed to stop you from selling later or selling before. It's like this is our best guess of like sort of where we think it's going to top out. So let me put in this take gain order. And then on the flip side, there are stop loss orders. Like I buy it at 50. If it gets to 35, uh, I'm going to sell. So, so they'll put those orders in in advance. And what you see with retail traders is that they cancel both orders, but for different reasons. <laughs> so they'll mm -hmm. cancer take gains in order to sell earlier. So if the take gain is like 65, they'll cancel it and sell at 58. All right. So we assume that's costing them money because they did some sort of right. calculation of how long that stock was still going to be positive expected value. So it's like you shaving $10 off your win just to get it in your pocket. Right. 
Uh, but on the flip side, they canceled the stop loss orders to blow on through it. <laughs> We're going to go down to 25. We're going down to 20. And it's We're always going, like, yeah. it's this, right? Ready? I mean, I thought it was a good buy at 50. Now it's 35. Now it's really a good buy. I'm buy. I'm doubling down. I'm going to, I'm going to buy more. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, so we can see that, that we see this in retail traders. And then you can also see it's a very interesting study that was done by Colin Kammerer, along with Richard Thaler and some other colleagues on New York city cab drivers. So these were in the days before Uber. Yeah. And you can see this kind of like miscalibration on sticking and quitting, like quit while you're ahead, stick while you're behind with these cab drivers. So uh, this, this work was done in the nineties, but they were looking at trip sheets of cab drivers from the eighties and thousands and thousands of trip sheets. And the thing about cab drivers is that they rent their cab. They rent the medallion for for 12 hours at a time. So obviously like they're not going to drive the whole 12 hours. At least I hope they're not. So they've got, they, but they have use of the cab for 12 hours. And what they wanted to ask is, were they optimizing? You know, this was trying to show, you know, what, because you know, economists have, had always said for a long time, like if you have the right financial se- incentives in place, people will optimize, you mm-hmm. know, for for that incentive. So obviously with the cab drivers, they're trying to m- maximize the amount of money that they make. And so the question that they had were, did their driving patterns actually maximize the amount of money they make? And it's pretty simple to figure out how they would do that. Uh, when there's lots and lots of fares to be picked up, pick them up. If there aren't any fares around, get out of your cab. So that it's very clear that that's going to be sort of your optimal strategy. In the same way that for a poker player, I want to like maximize the number of hours I'm playing in great games with really bad players where I'm feeling good. And if bad, you know, if really good players sit down in the game or I'm not feeling good or I don't think I'm playing well, I should get up and leave. Right. It's a very similar type of thinking. So what they found that was really interesting was that, you know, and they can tell from the chip sh- trip sheets because they can see how quickly the fares are coming in, that when there were lots of fares around, the drivers were quitting like really quickly. And when there were no fares around or the fares were really slow, they were driving for like the whole 12 hours. They weren't getting out of their cabs. So this is the flip of what should be rational or like an economist from the 1960s would have predicted that they would do. In fact, it uh, it was so bad that if you did compare it to what they were doing, like against the actual appropriate strategy, they would have made about 15% more than they actually were in earnings. And here's the kicker. If they were just random, like I'm going to drive six hours a day, I don't care when it is, they would do 8% better than what they were doing. So the question then becomes like, why were they quitting when things were good, when the going, you know, when the getting was good and sticking when things were really bad? And the answer is because they set a limit. They they were like, I want to earn this much money a day. So they had like an earnings goal. So let's Daily. say they want to earn $300 in a day. So now we can think about if you've got an earnings goal of $300, then um, as long as you're short of that $300, it's like you owe me that money, right? It's like you're in the losses, right? So right. we don't want to take that sure loss because if we get out of our cab, that it means we don't ever get the $300 and anything short of that we sort of experience as, as, as a loss. So they want to keep driving until they get to that $300. And as soon as they do that, they're okay. So what happens is the minute they hit that earnings goal, they're out of the cab. And if they don't, they stay in. That means they're get, they're going to hit, but they're going to hit that earnings goal when conditions are great. Faster. Yeah, when, it, yeah. when it's raining, when there's a big convention in town, right, all those exactly. kinds of things. Yeah. And that's when they stopped because then they didn't have, you know, th- that problem with sure loss aversion isn't getting kicked in, right? So, yeah. so Annie, we did a, an episode on this, a groove track episode on that exactly, that study. And I, I think you it. summarized it more succinctly and much better in five minutes than we took like 15 to do. So there you go. <laughs> so people, you don't even have to go listen, but if you want to get more no, details should. on the cab driver study, you go should. find it's a, it's a few and episodes also, back. Just, yeah. just so that people know, cause that, you know, everybody, you know, oh, it's the 1980s, whatever it, that work has been replicated. Yeah. I would just like it to has been, say it that. Has been it's, replicated it's, it was replicated times, on a so, yeah. very, very large set of data from Singapore a much larger set than the original study. So that has been replicated. Yeah. Well, one of the things yeah. that you talk about in the book, and I think is really interesting, and we've talked about here, is this idea about feeling, the, the, the sense of that we, we make these decisions based on gut feel, like you just ran Tim through that experiment, versus kind of the rational reality of that. 
And we know that it is very difficult to overcome that gut feel, particularly in the moment. So if I'm a listener and I'm sitting here, great, I, yeah, I definitely want to be able to quit at the appropriate time, but we know that there are these natural human tendencies that are going to get in the way and particularly this feeling of not wanting to quit and when we know we should, how do I overcome that? What are some of the tips that you've identified? Can we talk about how you don't overcome it for a second? No, I I like that even better. (laughs) Well, I think this is really important, though. Because Uh, So number one, knowing about it isn't going to help you overcome it. That's it. (sighs) I I I thought I'd be all safe. I thought I'd be perfectly fine now. So, you know, I mean, I see this pretty commonly with people in in finance. So the, the, the sunk cost effect, which I'm sure listeners are very aware of. So I'll just say it in one sentence, taking into account what you've already spent and deciding whether to continue and spend more, yeah. um, which you shouldn't do. Uh, Cause what should matter <laughs> is, uh, yeah. is the next dollar that I spend on this thing worthwhile or the next minute or the next bit of my attention, uh, what you already put into it, who cares? It's gone. It's gone. Can't get um, it back. But we can all feel that, right? Like it's like, uh, Oh, um, you know, I want to go see Shakespeare in the park, but it's like really rainy and cold. And a friend of mine offers me a free ki- ticket and I'm like, no way. I don't want to stand in the rain. But if I bought a ticket for like a hundred bucks to go see it and it's the exact same weather, I'm like, I'm going because I'm not wasting this ticket. <laughs> yeah. Um. So that's, that's the sum cost effect, right? So uh, this is a really big problem in finance. I mean, it's a problem everywhere, but it's a problem that finance people think about a lot because- what you don't want to do is exactly what Kahneman shows, right? Which is I bought it at 50, you know, now it's trading at 40. If I were looking at it today, there's no way I would buy it today, but I refuse to sell it, right? That's the thing that you don't want to have happen to you. It's terrible. Okay. So what they think though, is that, oh, I know about the sunk cost effect, period. (laughs) (laughs) And it's like, no, it, it's not how it works. Just because you know about it doesn't is, is not helpful at all. The other thing that isn't helpful is this thing that people say to me all the time, which is, oh, I've solved that. Because what I've told my traders is that every day they should look through their portfolio and say, would I buy this today? So intuitively, that feels like, well, if you know about the sunk cost effect, that's the whole problem, right? Like if I if it's raining and cold, and I had the opportunity to purchase the ticket today, would I purchase it today? Right. That's the question that you're asking yourself. And the answer, of course, is if, if the answer is no, then it shouldn't matter that you already happen to have purchased the ticket, but it does seem to matter to us. So they're like, okay, but if I know about that problem, then what I'm going to do is tell them to reframe and think about whether they would buy it today. And that doesn't help. Barry Staw, who's a real giant on the motivational side. So people people don't know him as well because he's not on the behavioral economic side, sort of the cognitive bias part of the equation. He's much more in the sort of motivational approach to these types of problems, thinking about escalation of commitment, identity, internal, external validity, cognitive dissonance. So those worlds come to the same answer, which is a nice example of consilience, but he's over from that side of the puzzle. And he's done really excellent work showing that If you try to trick yourself, like you do a Jedi mind trick, like, okay, I'm just going to ask myself if I'd buy it today, that it literally, literally doesn't, like, I'm not talking about, oh, it only helps a little. Like, it doesn't help in any way. It doesn't make you better at that decision. The problem, of course, is you're more confident because you think you came up with some sort of brilliant, you know, solution for the sunk cost effect, which you didn't. Okay, so those are the two things that just know don't work, That's which is really important. But here's the thing that does work. And I think I can get us there by talking about uh, something that happened on Mount Everest. So to to start with, like, what's a really good way to help yourself with this? So this particular Everest, there's a lot of stories about Everest. But, you know, uh, I mean, if you're going to tell write a book about grit, you're probably writing about Mount Everest. So maybe if you're going to write a book about quit, you should also, <laughs> of course should you also should. talk about Mount Everest. So I did. So our three climbers, the heroes of this story are Dr. Stuart Hutchinson, John Paskey, and Luke Kosicki. And they're part of a climbing group, you know, like the expeditions that are so popular. Um, this was in the 90s. Uh, and there's they're part of a group of eight climbers. I think it was like three Sherpas or so and an expedition leader. And they're going to try to summit Everest. Uh, they're all very experienced climbers. 
So when you're going up Everest, there's all sorts of climbs that you have to make because you start at base camp. You've got to get to camp one, camp two, camp three, camp four. And then camp four is the day that you would go for the summit. Um, so you got to sort of climb up and down the mountain so you can get acclimated. And for every single day's climb, there's something set, which is called a turnaround time. So a turnaround time is just simply if I'm not at a certain, you know, wh- wherever I am on the mountain today, if it gets to be this time of day, I have to turn around. So like on summit day, when you leave, you leave camp four at midnight, if you're not to the summit by 1 p.m., it doesn't matter where you are on the summit, at 1 p.m., you're supposed to turn around. And that set to really protect the climbers from the dangers of the descent. So the descent is when most people get into big trouble. They're suffering from hypoxia, often frostbite. They're really tired. uh, and, And it can get dark. And particularly on summit day, you don't really want to be climbing down Mount Everest in the dark. There's one part of the mountain, which is called the Southeast Ridge, which is incredibly narrow. And you're going to fall like either like thousands of feet into Nepal or thousands of feet into Tibet. (laughs) <laughs> depending uh, it's if bad you either slip. way it's right bad either left. way you get to choose but yeah. right or left <laughs> nepal or tibet <laughs> it's not good so so what they're you know the reason why you leave at midnight actually is so that you can get to the southeast ridge in daylight with enough time to get to the summit and get back down the southeast ridge in daylight all right so our three climbers hutchinson Tasky, and kasiski are going up the mountain and it's a particularly crowded day on the mountain there's a lot a lot of people and it's like really hard to get around them and whatever. So their expedition leader comes up behind them and Hutchinson says to the expedition leader, hey, seems like we're moving kind of slow. Like, how long do you think it is to the summit from here? Uh, the expedition leader says three hours and continues on ahead. Uh, and Hutchinson holds Tasky and Kasichki back and says, I think we have a problem because we just got told it's going to be three hours till we make the summit. And I'm looking at my watch and it's almost 1130 in the morning. Uh, and I can do some math and that means we're not going to get to some until two 30. Like, even if we were really fast, we'd get there at two and that's past the turnaround time. So it seems to me writings on the wall, we should really turn around. So, you know, like Tasky, he agreed right away. Kasiski took a little bit of, uh, convincing just because he was on what's called his seventh summit. So, uh, there's people who try to climb the seven highest mountains in the world. And, um, he had saved Everest for last. Uh, so he kind of wanted to complete that project. That's that thing of like, cab drivers having a goal, which yep. was very hard to turn around, right? Um, but anyway, they convince them and they turn around and they go back. Okay. So now I'm sure it's obvious to you why you've never heard of these guys. <laughs> they right? lived. Like, they lived. Right? <laughs> like nobody's making a movie like, oh, they're climbing. Oops. They oh, just decided they didn't to reach the top. They turned around halfway to the top and came right. back. Oh, they lived. <laughs> right. Well, 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 actually way more than halfway to the top. Because yeah, remember, they yeah. were coming from Camp Ford. They were probably about 300 feet from the summit when they turned around. It was pretty close. Wow. So, all right. So you've never heard of them. It's obvious why. This doesn't seem like that heroic a story. What else? Except they were in the expedition that was Rob Hall's expedition that was written about in Into Thin Air by John Cracker. Crackhauer. There was a documentary, yeah. a movie. Uh, we know Rob Hall went was the one who told them, oh, it's going to be three hours. He arrived at the summit at 2 p.m. Doug Hansen, his other client who was in the expedition, arrived at 4 p.m. He waited up there for Doug Hansen. They both died up on the summit. And, you know, and and in case you're saying, well, why didn't Krakauer write about these three people? He totally wrote about them. I challenge anybody who's got that book on their bookshelves to go read it. And what you're going to find is not only did he write about them, he said they were the best decision makers on the mountain that day. Yeah. Yep. Except you don't remember them because quitters are freaking invisible to us. They're not the heroes of the story. This is the problem, right? Like this option, this is why I was so frustrated. This option to quit is so valuable. And yet, even when we see people do it well, we're like, oh, ho-hum, like who cares, losers. Those people who died on the top of the mountain are the heroes, right? Okay, but this, why did they turn around? Because they had a turnaround time, which is a, I call a kill criteria, which Mm -hmm. is something that you think about in advance. It's like a stop loss is one of these as well. So this is like strategy number one is recognize that when you're in it, you're going to be terrible at this decision. So after you've already accrued the losses, after you already have the sunk costs, after you're already endowed to the project, you've, you've created ownership over it, after your identity is already wrapped up in the thing. That is when, when you say, well, would I buy it today? You're going to rationalize in the most bizarre ways that you would. 
So don't leave it until the box of chocolates is sitting right in front of you. <laughs> right? You you have to do it in advance. So they knew the turnaround time for Summit Day when they were down at base camp. Long before they were ever like in the shadow of the summit when summit fever sets in. Now, what's important to understand about kill criteria, and this story demonstrates it, is that setting them is not a guarantee that you will follow them. Right. But it is a guarantee that you are more likely to do it. Mm -hmm. Because had that turnaround time not, not been in place, those three guys wouldn't have turned around. So more people did turn around because of it, you know, and there were live saves because of it. And that's true for you as well. So like here, an example that I give from a company that I work with called MParticle, who is a SaaS company, they, they software as a service, you know, they have a, obviously a sales org there and sellers are like super gritty by nature, like gritty, gritty, gritty by nature. And so they'll end up pursuing le leads that are like really dead. I mean, they're dead long before they're dead because the, the person's never going to buy from you, but they don't ever want to give anything up. So that that's just kind of the nature of who they are, right? Which is a good quality unless it's overdone, which I would say it is in this case. So we just sent out a prompt to them to try to develop these kill criteria. Like what's the turnaround time? Yeah. And um, it was just, imagine it's six months from now, a lead you were pursuing is lost. Looking back, you realize there were early signals that that, you know, that that was going to happen. What were they? And there were things like in the first meeting that the potential customer only wanted to talk about price. Mm -hmm. Didn't care what we were selling. You know, then you're a stalking horse. Come on. They already have a competitor installed. All right. Like, really, you're going to like somehow overcome that inertia, right? Like we couldn't get a decision maker in the room. So they sort of figure out all of these things. And then um, we write those down as kill criteria. And now the sales leadership is supposed to be checking to see if they're following the kill criteria in order to get them to stop pursuing a lead. Because when you hear them, they're like, I know they have the competitor installed, but I know I can convince them. And it's like, no, go develop more leads. That's going to be more useful. I do this with all of my clients where we really create these, these kill criteria in order to allow them to, to spend their time doing the things that are worthwhile and less time doing the stuff that isn't worthwhile. Does that mean they still pursue them too long? Sure. But, you know, at least they're aware of these problems and they're not trying to make those decisions when they're already in the middle of the deal. And they're just more likely to walk away because of it. And that's a huge win, even if you're not going to be perfect at it. Yeah. You give a good example in the book, too, about if you're coaching somebody and you're realizing they need to quit here. And, and the steps to go through to do that. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because yeah. it is, it's kind of the same thing, but with a, with a twist. So, yeah. So the twist is the second strategy for being better at quitting, which is get somebody to help you. <laughs> yes. Cause the problem is like, uh, so I'll pick on Kurt this time. Have you ever seen Tim? See how I did that? <laughs> Have you ever seen Tim doing something where you're looking at him going like, why isn't Tim quitting? Every day. I don't know. Right. What, what, the, I don't know if I've seen the opposite, but yeah. Okay. Right. And you're, where, where you're sitting there like, or, or not Tim, but like a friend of yours no, who's in I'm, a relationship. I'm joking. And you're I'm like, joking. I, I, yeah. Rarely, but there have been occasional times. Right. You know, they're pursuing a project. They're sticking with a client. You know, someone's in a job, whatever, where you're looking from the outside, like going, you know, like what is going on? Like, why are they still in this? It's so obvious to you from the outside what is not obvious to you from the inside. Like even when we look at the Everest situation, when the people kept climbing, we all look at that and go, well, I wouldn't be that dumb. <laughs> right. 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 Like, oh wow. my God, the weather was really bad and it was slow and late. And I would have turned around just like those three guys. Except it's for like, the peak really? is only 300 feet away. That's and right. I'm looking at it going, I can And do let that. me tell you yeah. something. Rob Hall was a much more experienced alpinist than you are. And if he didn't do well right. at that decision, I can guarantee you it would have been really hard for you to. Exactly. So, yeah. so that's the thing is that we need to realize like when we're in it, we can't see it. But when people are not in it with us, they can see it. And so get them to help you. So this brings up exactly what you're talking about is you can combine this idea of a quitting coach, someone who can help you by sort of seeing what you can't see with kill criteria to get this really powerful mix that really helps us quit. Yeah. So Ron Conway, venture capitalist, angel investor, founder of SB Angel, actually like one of the most successful angel investors of all time. You know, when you talk to him, you would think that if you talk to him, that the thing he would be most proud of is like all the companies that he shepherded to great success, <laughs> right? Um, which is true. Oh, yeah. he, great, you know, great job. Yeah. But, but it's not the thing he's most proud of. The thing he's most proud of is getting people to quit. And because he, the way he puts it is so well, he's like, look, 
I invest in these companies. It's really early stage, you know, because it's angel. Um, you know, it might be one person or a couple. And you're going to find out a whole bunch of things like relatively fast. And when I see that it's not going well, I really pride myself on getting someone to shut it down because honestly, life is too short. He's like, I, I invested in the person because I think they're brilliant. And I think that they can change the world. And when I see that it, this isn't the thing that's going to actually allow them to do that, I want them to stop because you only have a certain number of minutes in your life. And I want them to spend those minutes on something that I know they can achieve that's great. So he really, he, he's got this mantra of life's too short to be spending your time on things that aren't worthwhile, sticking to things that aren't worthwhile. And this is where we can think about endowment, right? Like when, when a founder, a founder, the word, right, has, has created a product that they want to sell or, or a company or a service that they want to sell, they're the owner of it. And we know from the work on endowment that we really value much more highly the things we own than the things that we don't own. We think that our stuff is more beautiful. Like our car, when we look at the Kelly Blue Book, we're like, that's not true. My car is worth more than that. <laughs> and when we're buying an identical car, we're like, they priced it too high. That's that's that endowment effect, right? So founders are incredibly endowed to their work. So it's it's extra hard for them. And they've also done something that is like a stake in the ground defining their identity, right? Like when we do things that are really mainstream, it doesn't get tied into our identity because everybody else does it. Like the fact that I thought for a long time of my life that Pluto was a planet isn't part of my identity. So if you tell me it's not, I don't care. Because it's not an unusual belief, right? right but when we get out right. to the extremes, when we're gonna when we're doing something that's really different than other people, becomes that also becomes very hard for us. So we can see this with founders, right? Like this endowment and identity and all all this. It's very hard to get them to stop. So he'll come to them when he sees it, and he'll say, "You know, Kurt, let's just both talk about the fact that things aren't going that well, right? Like maybe you're not acquiring customers, or you're not able to, you know." create, you know, get product market fit or, uh, you know, things are like really over schedule or you're spending a lot more money or, or my whatever. my co-host keeps messing up all the time. I got to right, get rid exactly. of them. I know. Yeah. I, still, I know it's so yeah, hard. Right. Yeah. So, so I come to you and I say, Kurt, like, let's admit it's not going well. And they'll, they'll sort of walk through, like, you know, given what you thought you were going to be able to achieve, like, here are the things that aren't going well. And then inevitably what happens because even though we have an intuition that when crap's not going well, you're going to, you know, you're just going to be like, okay, I'm done. That's not what happens. They say <laughs> what everybody says in this situation, which is I know I can turn it around. Like uh, I'm about to push out some new code or I've got a new marketing plan or I'm, you know, whatever. It's like, it's always, I know I can turn it around. And here's the really interesting he does as a quitting coach is he doesn't disagree with them, no. which would be what our, like, that would be our instinct. Is like to tell them, no, you're wrong. <laughs> I can see it's terrible. <laughs> um, but remember that they're in it. Yeah. yeah. I can't so it's going to be, it. they can't see it. So you're not going to get them to do this. Right. So instead, what he does is he says, okay, Kurt, I, you can turn it around. Obviously, that's why I invested you in the first place. I think you're amazing. But can we like agree because life's so short? that we should try to find out really fast because I want you to be move on, be able to move on to something that's amazing. And so they'll work out like, well, how long? So you've got this new thing. You think you're gonna be able to turn around, like how long until that happens, right? So let's say that they figure out it's two months right. or by the end of the next quarter or whatever. So three months. He says, great. Okay. What does that look like in three months? If we think about what does it mean that you've turned it around? then what do those benchmarks look like in the future? And what's interesting is this is very much what Barry Staw found, that if you set these benchmarks in the future, that then when you hit up, butt up against those benchmarks, you start to get much better behavior around de-escalation of commitment, right? Like actually yeah. de-escalating. So we'll sit down and you'll say, well, I think that this is like going to be the net new revenue that I'm going to have generated. I'm going to have hired this key position. And I'm going to have experienced, uh, you know, grow customer growth, you know, week over week customer growth or month over month customer growth of whatever. So we now we now work together, right? And we set those benchmarks. So let's say we set them for two months from now. And then he says, great, now we've got this. Let's agree that we're going to revisit in two months. And if you haven't hit these marks, that we're going we're gonna to shut it down at that point. 
So now we're like talking about a future version of yourself. So he's now acting as a quitting coach. He can see what they can't see. And he's helping them to get into the future where they aren't, you know, where it's a, sort of a different version of themselves. They're not in it. And he's now has permission to have a real quitting conversation with him when they miss in two months. And that actually works really well. Like if we take that example, that's going to get us to these decisions the fastest. And, you know, I think one of the things that's really important to realize is like, I've had people say to me, but isn't he doing a disservice to the founders? Because if he sees it literally right then, then why is he letting them go on for two more months? And the answer is because otherwise they'd go on for another year and a half. Yeah. 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 Oh, uh, taking the the Everest analogy, right? So if they couldn't have convinced the two other, I can't remember who was trying to do the convincing of that next person, the, this idea Hutchinson. would have been. Yeah. Hutchinson and Tasky were trying to convince. Yeah, Hutchinson, yeah. you know, could have said, all right, well, let's, we have a half hour. Yes. If we make it to X point, then, yeah. then we can continue. If we don't, then let's re-examine. Then, then let's turn around. Exactly. Yeah. So he didn't so, have to do that, but actually, yeah, that would, that would have been. That would have been an amazing strategy. And and that's the thing. It's like Barry Staw tried a whole bunch of things. Like he demonstrated escalation of commitment just in pretty simple business decisions. Like yeah. you decide to invest in some division of a company. You yeah, get five experiment- years worth of, yeah. Those so experiments good. are cool in your book. But let's, uh, yeah. So endowment though, and let's bring it back to Barry Staw and Barry Staw's family, right? Because you yeah. tell a really good story in the book about Barry Stoss family. And uh, so just. All right. So I got to give you a little backstory on this. Yes. First. Yes. There yeah, you go. Good, good backstory. So, too. so when I first started thinking about quit, which was in like October of 2020, I immediately started pinging people because I wanted to get on Zooms and talk to a bunch of people. Um, and one of the people that I talked to was Barry Stock because he's, he really is like a very, he looms large yeah. over the escalation. He's of the in the first place yeah. right there. Yeah. 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 And um, so I'm talking to him and he just makes this comment about the way that we rationalize, you know, away the sort of like quitting thing. Because there was a business that his father was going to buy. So he was already like pretty into it. And his, you know, Barry at this point had taken some accounting classes at like the University of Michigan or something. And um, he just shows him the balance sheet for the business. He says, well, tell me what you think. And Barry says he sits down with it and he's like, he can't figure out like this thing's a dog. He's like, it's not make. I don't even know why my father wants to buy it. And so he says that to his dad and his dad said, no, you don't understand. And he crosses out like the assets column and increases that by 20%. And then the deficit column, like he crosses that out and decreases it by 20% because he's, I'm going to make 20% more money at 20% less the cost. So anyway, that was all he said to me, right? It just is like a funny anecdote. Yeah. So anyway, I we were more talking about the science side, right? And I get off that call and it was just like a mind bug where I, I kept thinking about like, what's this deal with his dad? So I think like a week later, I wrote him again. I go, do you mind giving me some more time on Zoom? Because I'd really like to talk about your dad. And he's like, what? Why? And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. I just have some questions. <laughs> so... So I, I call him up and I, and now we, we really have a Zoom that's just about his dad because we had already talked about all of the science. And I just want to also say about Barry Starr, like he did this amazing work in escalation of commitment, which when you hear him talk about it and even in his papers, he says was really about the Vietnam War, yeah. which is yeah. an ex- incredible example of escalation of commitment. Like you get involved in that war and things never go well, but you just keep going. So mm. that was really what for him was the genesis of this. But I'm, I'm now very curious about his father. So I call him up and here's the story that I find out. So his dad, Harold Staw, uh, moved to California, as many people were at that time. This was like in the 40s, meets um, his mom, who was also an East Coast transplant, Shirley Posner. And Harold and Shirley get married. So Harold, Harold and Shirley Staw are living... Um, they were living in LA and then they moved to the Inland Empire and they had like a little grocery store. But I think there were like some really big chains. So he just had a tiny little grocery store, some big chains coming in and he sort of figured out that the grocery store wasn't going to do well. So he quit that. But notice here, he there's not a lot of endowment to it, right? Like it's a tiny yeah. little store. He's sort of scratching by whatever, you know, the stop and shop comes in and he's like, whatever. So anyway, he sells that store, but he has a really good idea, which is there's a Kaiser factory. This is like in the post-war boom, right? There's a Kaiser factory, which is a manufacturing facility uh, that's unionized. And so uh, he gets himself some space in what 
uh, is a little storefront that used to house chickens. Yeah. So it's like basically a chicken coop. And um, he gets some, a storefront there and he's going to sell appliances to the union members. And so he starts this thing called the union story, which is what it was called. And he you know, sweeps out the chicken feathers and he gets some floor models because uh, he can't actually st- have, you know, stock there because it's too small. But the deal is that the union members are going to get a discount. So they come in, they sort of browse, you know, I want that fridge. Uh, he orders it for them at a, at a deep discount because they're union members. Well, it turns out that this thing takes off. So he very quickly like kind of gets out of the the chicken coop. He opens a bigger store. He opens another location in the same area, changes the name actually to ABC stores because he drops the union requirement altogether. He actually ends up with like this kind of like lifetime lease, this permanent lease on a, a 50,000 square foot property in Montclair where he's he's selling his stuff. And now he becomes more like what we would think about as like a Kmart, right? Like there's appliances, but he's also selling household goods and things like that. So he's expanded away from appliances and it's it's great. And he starts, there's a highway that's being built from the Inland Empire, which is, you know, it, sort of away from the coast in California out to LA. And he just sort of starts expanding his empire along this highway until he actually gets all the way out to Los Angeles. And he's acquiring competitors along the way. And he ends up with like a lot of stores, like really big business. Then there's an offer from a another set of very similar sort of Kmart like stores. And this is all happening in like the fifties and sixties, which is in Texas. And they are called Sage stores, similar concept. They originally started off uh, selling at a discount to government workers, Um, but they've got a whole bunch of stores in Texas. So the California operation and the Texas operation merge Barry, uh, Barry Stahl's dad, Harold becomes the CEO of the whole thing. And if you look at the the filings back then, Harold Stahl at this point is worth $3 million. It's a lot big, of money. Big deal in that tip. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah, exactly. So now what happens is that, as I kept saying, these are very sort of Kmart-like, right? Well, SS Kriege, uh, which became Kmart, uh, had started opening stores already. And they now start opening stores in California, often like literally right next or down the street or across from uh, ABC stores. And they're they're very well funded, a huge chain, lots of money. And, you know, it's basically what happens is that the California operation starts faltering. Now, this is not a problem for the Texas operation. Walmart existed at that time, but only in Arkansas. And Kmart had not yet come to, to Texas and like Target didn't exist yet. So the Texas stores now are booming. They're making money hand over fist but the California stores start to lose money. So the shareholders now say, we want to sell the California stores and just keep the Texas stores because the California stores are like a drag on the whole company. And he says, no, Mm. I don't want to do that. Not only does he say no, but when the shareholders sue him, the person who files the lawsuit is like one of his really good friends and his lawyer who switches sides and sides with the Texas folks to basically push him out of the business because he refuses to sell off the California assets. So he, the agreement is basically they just unscramble the eggs and the Texas stores, they take them back. He takes the California stores. And then there are two partners that he had who had two stores that he had had bought out that also take their two stores. So now he's left with these failing stores. Like talk about like escalation of commitment. Like, his lawyer switched sides. It's terrible. It's right. absolutely terrible. So like the stores are losing money. Like it's really bad. So now what happens is that he's got the stores. They're losing money. He starts to put his financial fortune into propping these stores up. Then by some luck of the draw in the early 70s, he gets an offer from Fred Meyer, which is like a people know it from like Oregon. Yeah. Uh, to, they want a foothold in California. So they offer to buy his stores. He says no to that also because he doesn't think they're offering him enough. And eventually what happens is that all the stores go bankrupt. He has to shut them all down. And he's just left with this lease on the Montclair property, which allows him to sort of subsist. So he goes from being a very rich man to having no money. And and this is like such a typical story of escalation of commitment, right? Where there's so many signals. I mean, not just the balance sheet that you could be looking at, but like the, his friend who switched sides. Yeah. And that's Barry Stahl's dad. Yeah. I, I just, it's amazing, you know? And then Barry Stahl ends up being like one of the 
lead researchers in the world <laughs> that researches this phenomenon. And he didn't, he never really related it to his father. Yeah. But the endowment effect is right there. You can see it. I built this. I, they were my babies. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. He was the owner of the California stores, cognitively speaking. Yeah. Yeah. Right. He wasn't the owner of the Texas stores. He didn't yeah. build that empire. And, and he so could why was he up. valuing it? Yeah. Right. He, he, he could give up the Texas stores. He didn't care, even though they were profitable. Yeah. That's how much we overvalue the things we own. I, I don't <sighs> care about those. I want to keep the stuff that I built because those are the things that are really yeah. beautiful. Annie, we could talk for hours and hours more, which, you know, at some point we will. But um, <laughs> right now, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as always insightful, fun, witty. Can't just, I can't thank you enough. So, well, thank you so much for having me on for the fourth time, but I'm telling you, I'm velvet jacket. Velvet jacket. <laughs> if you come on the fifth time, we will get you a jacket. It will be emblazoned with the, you know, whatever behavioral grooves logo we got. And okay, you can awesome. wear it proudly uh, when you go to the t- today show and you, you uh, get on, on, on camera there. So, okay. Um- <laughs> I'm super excited. All right. I have to I have to go, but it's so fun, you guys. Thank you. I'm Thank gonna you. hop really faster. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I share ideas on what we learned from our fourth discussion with Annie Duke. Have a free flowing conversation and talk about whatever else comes into our quitting minds. I don't know. I mean, do our minds quit? I think I think we don't quit enough, right? Is that that's it's, what yeah. she's saying? Yeah, that's yeah. The, that's the problem is that we don't quit enough. Oh. And, and yeah. Although my uh, brain quits quite a bit. I mean, it just quits. So You're just damn lazy. That's the <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it's probably a bit of laziness and just like stupidity. I don't know. It just doesn't, it can't go on. I, I don't understand anymore. So I'm just going to quit. I'm going to shut down. There you go. Well, what did you take away from, what, what do you want to groove on first? What did you take away from our conversation with Annie? That quitting is good, that it's gotten a bad rap mm-hmm. and that we don't do it enough. You know what it reminded me of, Tim, is it reminded me of our conversation about regret. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Totally. Again, regret got this bad rap and, you know, it was all these things. But in reality, you know, you can use regret and it can be a powerful tool. And I think quitting has this bad rap and that we need to rethink how we think about quitting. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, for listeners who are wondering about that regret, that's a Dan Pink book and, and a Dan Pink episode. And it was it was pretty great. It also reminds me of our conversation with Roy Baumeister about anticipated regret. Ooh, right? Because yeah. there's there's an element of if we quit, then we have to figure. Then there, it creates a problem that oh now now what do I do? If I stop doing this, then I have to have something else to do, and that that creates a problem in my mind. And you know we're anticipating that we're going to have to solve a, a problem when we quit something. And and we don't like that. Um, yeah. I, I also just love the, the, you know, the reference to the, the cab driver study, you know, well, you it, love it, the cab driver study. I it do. was what got you kind of really interested in behavior it was, science. It was my gateway drug. It really was. <laughs> <laughs> Your gateway. <laughs> and, and, yeah. um, and I love that, that she framed it. You know, I, I hadn't thought about it in terms of the, the quitting specifically, I've always thought about it in terms of the reward, right? That w- wasn't enough, and that we sort of miscalculate that and and misappropriate it. But she reframed it as she does so beautifully, and I, yeah. I love that. Yeah. Well, and the the idea that we for many times we don't quit um, fast enough, but yes. in certain situations we quit too soon, and that's what I love about this book. Is this book isn't just saying, "Hey, folks, you know we." We we don't quit enough and we need to quit more. It's about you. We need to quit more at more appropriate times, both sometimes yeah. we hang on yeah. too long, but other times we quit too soon. And I love how she brings the message from a poker kind of thing and expected value and all of those things. The yeah. book is really powerful when she gets into those components and really what I love about Annie is she takes these concepts from behavior science. She did it in Thinking in Bets. She she does it again in this book of just taking these concepts that, I don't know, you and I have talked about. We've talked about 
loss aversion and various different aspects that she brings to this specifically around some of those aspects. But she puts this. That's right. So they're really familiar to us. They're familiar to us, but she puts a twist on them. And she she talks about them in a way that becomes very familial. And I can now use these in everyday situations because all of a sudden it's like, ow. It's this simple concept, this, you know, like, so. Yeah, give, I, I, yeah, talk, give us an example of what you're talking about. So I think this idea of the loss aversion versus sure loss aversion, right? And it's yeah. all kind of this whole component that's wrapped around loss aversion. But the way that she talks about this is that when you're in the gains or when you're, you know, um, having a, a, a loss kind of element within this. And so like, Now I get that. I get this idea of risk and the idea that we are more risk seeking when we're in loss. This idea that I have a $50, I bought a stock at $50 and now it's at 40, right? That concept, the way that she talked about that, it just crystallized that whole element of sure loss for me in a way that I knew cognitively before but I didn't really feel it. And so it took that Kahneman and Tversky component and it made it come to life for me. Uh, Well said. Um, I have nothing to say more than that other than I really agree with it and I I love it. (laughs) Well, and I like, so another key piece of this that I thought was, that I found really interesting is so she talked about quitting in her last book, How to Decide, right? And she had a, she had a part of of a chapter on it And in there, she talked about this idea that quitters often win and winners often quit, Mm -hmm. which is exactly opposite of the, you know, you know, winners never quit and quitters never win kind of component. And she, again, takes that and twists that around. And I think that's the new mantra that I'm going to going to be using for the next at least couple months. Yeah. Culturally, we need to move away from lionizing the marathon runner that breaks their tibia as they're, (laughs) you know, as they're running through uh, as like they're on mile six of the marathon, they got 20 miles to go and they break their leg and yet they finish. We we need to stop lionizing that. We need to stop heralding and praising this kind of um, behavior because it's just, it's just a bad idea. Like just stop, get up, you know, just get out of the course. Just say, okay, I broke my, I broke my leg. I'm, I'm done. And that's okay. Um, and I'm going to heal and then run another day. This isn't the last. This isn't the only time that, you know, this is an exploratory mindset that she talks about. I, I want to come down from the mountain, right? I mean, my objective <laughs> isn't to right. reach the peak of the mountain and then die up there. My objective is to reach the peak and then come down. But if I can't reach the peak, the more important goal is getting down alive, right? That's right. That is it. It's not. Uh, completing that marathon and I will be forever crippled or crippled so bad that it's going to take my recovery time for this is, is tremendous. I need to be able to rethink and have a different mindset about quitting. And, and that comes back to this, the, the, the story she, she told about Roy. I can't remember his last name, the venture capitalist, um, who is most proud about. Um, getting people to quit. And I think that was a really mm-hmm. instructional story because what I took from that is that he had a mindset that was different. His mindset was, look, life is too short for us to spend time wasting it on things that aren't going to be good. Yep. And that mindset allowed him to get past and to help other people get past this kind of a global view that quitting is bad. No, quitting is good in the right times that if you're not passionate about this, if this isn't something that is going to lead to future success, that we need to stop our losses now because life is too short. And I love this idea of can we modify our own mindsets and and maybe (laughs) take on that new mantra that quitters often win and winners often quit. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. That was just where I was going with that. Well, along with this idea of reframing something that we're really familiar with, you you and I are plenty familiar with the endowment effect mm-hmm. and how it it's a it's a bias that interrupts a lot of things. 
you you want to buy my white mug here, Tim? Because I will pay or I will sell it to you for a very no. extremely high price. No, Kurt, my white mug is so much better. Oh, my uh, white mug is better. My <laughs> white mug is better. <laughs> this is a big problem. Endowment is a really central and big problem in uh, in the the resistance to quitting. And I thought that was a really clever thing that she brought up. That she she wrote about and talked about in our conversation because I don't I, I don't think people think about it when we think no. about quitting. We, Again, no, not at all. This is the this is the brilliance of Annie Duke is she takes these concepts that we all know we know endowment not all of us but you know the people who listen to this show have probably heard about endowment and yet we twist that and all of a sudden now I'm a, I'm thinking about why I don't quit oh it's because I'm endowed because I put some effort into this it's yeah. that idea that I I develop myself. It's the store that I built, that yeah, it's it, the exactly. project that I have put my blood, sweat, and tears into. And now I feel a sense of endowment with it. So yeah, not only do I not want to quit because of all the other factors that were talked about, but I feel the sense of endowment with it. Yeah. And I feel like that's that's a big thing a really wonderful light to bring to the, the the way that we look at quitting and go, oh, that's a problem that I can, that's actually bigger than just quitting. That's a problem. Uh, and the endowment in, in my life is something that I really need to be aware of to, yeah. to try to be more sensitized to, to try to tame that down a bit. Yeah. I, I don't need more endowment in my life. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> you know. Our brains try to fool us. All, all the, the time. time, all the time. And that's one of the things that I think we take away from this is that our brains are fooling us into feeling yes. like because we put time and effort into this, that, you know, we it's, it's somehow better than what it is. And even when the rest of the world is screaming at us to quit, we're going, no, you guys don't understand. You don't see this. No, that's probably our brains doing some <laughs> crazy foolishness of trying to to make us feel yeah. more endowed with this or this yeah. idea that you know there's this loss of version that that we're going to do and i mean they're, they're, those are real feelings that's yeah. the big big yeah. piece of this those are real feelings mm -hmm. but i think that there is this aspect that we need to just rethink how we um view quitting and that idea yeah i had a, a psychotherapist who used to say you know those voices in your head well, just remember that they're lying to you. <laughs> <laughs> Our brains do lie to us. It's it's crazy. You know, I mean, that's why I love visual illusions. It's like you sit there and you go, and, wait, no, that's that's definitely this. And you're looking, no, it's not. That line is not longer than that other line. And yet that's what we see. And our brains do that to us all the time. So Agreed. I want to leave kind of the grooving session. We talked a little bit about it with Annie. But again, what are some of the ways that we can maybe take on quitting in a more rational perspective? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know, this yeah. idea of tips. Yeah, yeah. Tips of how to quit better. Yeah, absolutely. You know, for me, the, the, uh, and I mentioned this earlier, the, the exploratory mindset, like, you know, that just realize that today isn't the end. And I go back to like being a teenager, you know, the, the first girl that I dated who dumped me, I just thought, oh life is over. Well, guess what? Life isn't over. Years later, I'm still living. I've got the like the best relationship of my whole life. You know, my life partner is just fantastic. And so when we quit something, have the exploratory mindset to go, there's going to be more. Yeah. And and avoid, I think, loss aversion, this idea of the, the sure loss aversion trap, right? Yeah. That idea yeah. that, oh, look, loss aversion stops you from starting. A sure loss stops you from quitting uh, and just mm -hmm. understand that we get stuck in that. All right. This is a hypothetical loss right now. And I don't want to make it a sure loss. But in reality, you know what? We get stuck in that yeah. kind of loop and we need to make sure that we get ourselves out of that loop. Yeah. Uh, another one that I really liked is the kill criteria. Oh, awesome. This idea that before you start the project, say, OK, and this is especially true in business. OK, we're going to put this much time, this much effort into it. If we get to that point and we still don't have some kind of a minimum viable product or whatever you're what, again, whatever, whatever metrics we want to, to kind of set. Totally, totally. Whatever metric. If you don't get there, 
then say, are we actually close enough to, to keep going, to put more time, more effort, more energy, more relationship, whatever it is? Yeah. Pull the kill switch. Pull yep. it. And if, just we're say, not, if we're not at the peak at 1 p.m., I don't care if we're 15 feet from it or whatever it is, we, we need to turn go. around, right? Yep. We have to turn around. Yeah. So I, I love that. And it's hard because we are. We're so close to the peak, but if we're not there. We're going to, we, you know, the likelihood of dying on the way down, is it worth, you know, taking that risk? And probably not. That's why we set that kill criteria up for the way that it is. And I also love this idea of having a quitting coach, right? Get someone to help you. You know, you need, you need that outside perspective. You need somebody that is going to be there to help you to talk through this, to just let you know that your brain is fooling you. And this is, probably a really good thing. You this know? is this is such a great piece of advice that goes well beyond just quitting. But, you know, when I think about the the, the work from uh, Dan Gilbert that, that recommended, like, if you are thinking about living in a particular area of town, go to that part of town, talk to someone who lives there. Yeah. If you're, if you're, if you're wondering what it's like to, to be retired, talk to a re- retiree, you know, I, like actually just go ahead and Talk to those people who have had that experience. And the quitting coach is like, okay, they've lived through stuff. Get their perspective because they are not you. That's the most important part of it is that they're not me and that they're going to have this lovely objective opinion. Yeah, I mean, life coaches are valuable and, and they don't have to be paid life coaches. You don't need to have somebody with a with a doctor or, you know, some like high flutin degree. You can just have a good friend yeah. uh, be there for you. and. In this, you know, have these conversations of saying, look, we're going to support each other. And part of that is telling me when I need to quit something when I'm not and vice versa. Right? Call them a BFF, call them a mentor, call them whatever you want to call them, but get that outside perspective and trust them. Okay. All right. So we could probably talk about (laughs) all of the insights from this conversation I mean, as well as from the other three conversations that we had with Annie and and we're not even starting on that, but we could do that for hours. So I think it's time we quit talking about that. What do you think? Uh, (laughs) It's funny how with Annie, we always tend to run long, too. Yeah. We yeah. we just can't quit Annie. Oh, okay, okay. Bada boom. Got it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Got the fun. <laughs> All right, seriously. So so much great insight and such a wonderful person. Yeah. Yeah, truly. Truly. So, Groovers, we hope you've enjoyed this episode. And if you did, we would really love it if you would share that with someone. We would yeah, really as, appreciate that. As much as we love Apple and Spotify, okay, you might not love Spotify, Tim, but, you know, and all the other pod services out there, one of the things that we know is that they do a very poor job at bringing shows like ours to new listeners. Yeah, so so this this search function is horrible in general. Unless you're at an absolute superstar or a celebrity, the best way to get the word out uh, uh, to get more listeners is through you, our current listeners. Yeah, so send a link of this episode to a friend, ask them to subscribe. Remember, you can let them know they can always quit at any time. Oh God, I, you're overworking this. <laughs> I, what I am would never do that. You you're, are you telling me I should quit? Are you are you being a coach and saying I should yes. quit with the jokes? You okay. think you're so sly? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sneaky that way. Okay, yeah. all right. Well, uh, you're also very effective, and so so thank you for that. <laughs> all right, listeners, make sure you reassess what you're sticking with this week. And maybe it's time to quit something so you can go out and find your groove.